Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Royal Society. My name is Andy Hopper. I'm a treasurer, but perhaps of relevance to this, I'm professor of computer technology at Cambridge University as well. So the Society has been around for uh, a little while, and over those centuries, 350-something uh, uh, years, <coughs> It has played its part, its fellows have played its part in some of the most important uh, discoveries and actually practical use over the years uh, as well. And uh, in April 2017, about a year ago, uh, we uh, launched a uh, report on machine learning. Actually, it's a series of reports, what might be called the digital area on cybersecurity, on machine learning, uh, actually on teaching computer science, that sort of uh, uh, thing. However, our report on uh, machine learning called for action in a number of areas over the next uh, years. Uh, we use the phrase careful stewardship in relation to machine learning data and that sort of things. To ensure that uh, the benefits of this technology I felt right across uh, society and that we encourage, facilitate, participate in a public debate uh, on this broad uh, topic and uh, discuss how the benefits are uh, distributed as well as trying to think ahead of some of the perhaps uh, dangers and other uh, things. Uh, this series of uh, events and lectures, which is uh, supported by DeepMind, uh, we hope will help develop a public conversation about uh, machine learning, AI, and so on, uh, and, and provide a forum for a debate about the way these technologies may actually will already do affect the lives of everybody on the planet. So it's great to see you here at what is our first event. And so we have uh, Demis Hassabis, a superstar, uh, to give our first uh, lecture in this series. And uh, I'm very pleased to say he was an undergraduate uh, in my department, so, <laughs> you know, boy done good. Uh, we, li <laughs> we, uh, we like that sort of thing uh, in, in my parts, uh, well, everywhere else, I guess, as well. So that's good, but then he went on uh, to uh, do a PhD in neuroscience at UCL. Very interesting thing, which you'll see actually comes together in, in his work. And then he did a couple of things, but uh, co-founded DeepMind in 2010. Uh, he's very distinguished. Uh, he's received uh, a fellowship of the Royal Academy of Engineering, uh, also the silver medal and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts as well. In 2014, DeepMind was acquired by Google and has grown enormously. I note it re re retains the name DeepMind, uh, which I think is very interesting, positive, uh, but also has uh, uh, activities in uh, Edmonton, Montreal, and an applied uh, team in Mountain View. So, uh, Demis, has done well, to the point that, for example, on the one hand, Time listed him as one of the 100 most important people, influential, sorry, people in the world. Um, but also, he was uh, awarded a CB uh, for services to science and technology. So welcome, uh, Demis, and we look forward to all our minds being improved on your <laughs> favorite topic. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, Andy, for that very uh, kind introduction. And uh, thank you all uh, for taking the time to come this evening. Um, it's great to see you all here. So we're very proud at DeepMind to be supporting this very important lecture series here at the Royal Society. Um, you know, we think that given the potential of AI to both transform and disrupt our lives, we think it's incredibly important that there's a public uh, debate and public engagement between the researchers at the sort of forefront of this field um, and the broader public. 
Uh, and we think that's very critical going forwards as more and more of this technology comes to affect our everyday lives. So what we're hoping here, and uh, the idea behind the, this Royal Society lecture series is to sort of open up a, 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 a forum for, to facilitate a kind of open and robust conversation about the potential and the possible pitfalls uh, inherent in the advancing of AI. So I look forward to answering all your questions uh, at the end of the talk. So today I'm going to, uh, uh, to talk about AI, but specifically focused around how AI could be applied to scientific discovery itself. Um, I thought this was particularly appropriate given this is a lecture at the Royal Society, um, but it's also the thing that uh, I'm most passionate about. So this is the reason why I've spent my whole life and my whole career um, on trying to advance the state of AI, is that I believe um, if we build AI in the right way and deploy it in the right way, um, it can actually help um, advance the state of science itself. So I'll come back to that theme uh, throughout this talk. So to begin with, um, the kind of way, you know, there's no exact definition of what AI is, but a, a kind of loose heuristic I think that's, worth, that's kind of worth keeping in mind is AI is the sort of science of making machines smart. Uh, that's what we're trying to do uh, uh, when we embark on this endeavor of, of building AI. And DeepMind itself, my company, uh, we founded it in London in 2010. Um, we became part of Google in 2014, um, but we still run independently um, uh, right here in King's Cross, uh, just up the road. And uh, the way to think about DeepMind and the vision behind it was to try and bring together some of the world's top researchers in all the different sub-disciplines that were relevant to AI, from neuroscience to machine learning to mathematics, um, bring them together with some of the world's top engineers and a lot of compute power, and to see how far could we push the frontiers of AI. Um, and how quickly could we make progress? So you can think of it as like an Apollo program effort for AI. And nothing until that point, until we found the DeepMind existed, that was really uh, uh, set up to do this in this way. Another explicit thing behind this, the vision that we had for DeepMind was um, to try and come up with a new way to organize science. And, and what I mean by that, and this would be a whole lecture in itself, is could we fuse together the best from um, the top academic labs and the blue sky thinking and the rigorous science that goes on in those places with the kind of um, the, a lot of the philosophy behind the best startups or best uh, technology businesses in terms of um, the, the amount of energy and focus and pace that they bring to bear uh, on their missions. Um, so would it be possible to kind of fuse together the best from both of these two worlds? And that's the way you can think about the culture at DeepMind as a kind of hybrid culture um, that mixes the best from both of those two, uh, uh, two fields. Now, what is our mission at DeepMind? Uh, well, we articulate it as a kind of two-step process. And it's slightly tongue-in-cheek, but we, we, we take it very seriously. But, so this is how we articulate it. Step one, um, fundamentally solve intelligence. And then we feel if we were to do that, then step two would naturally follow. Use it to solve everything else. And so what we mean by solve intelligence is actually, to just unpack that slightly, is to fundamentally understand this phenomenon of intelligence what it is, um, what kind of process is it. And then if we can understand that, can we recreate the important aspects of that artificially and make it sort of universally abundant and available? So that's what, we're, what we mean by this solve intelligence first part of this mission. And I think if we are to do that in a general way, um, both DeepMind and, and, the, and the research community at large, then I think naturally uh, step two will follow in terms of we can bring this technology to bear on all sorts of problems that for the moment seem quite intractable to us. So things like, you know, perhaps as far afield as climate science, all the way to curing diseases like cancer that we don't know how to do yet. I think AI could have a role to play, an important role to play as a very powerful tool um, in all of these different scientific and, and, and medical and endeavors. So that's the, the high level mission. Uh, and that's our guiding star at DeepMind. But how do we go, plan to go about this more pragmatically? So what we talk about is trying to build the world's first general purpose learning machine. And the key words here are obviously learning and general. And so all the algorithms that we work on at DeepMind uh, are learning algorithms. And what we mean by that is that they learn how to uh, master certain tasks uh, automatically from raw experience or raw input. So they find out for themselves the solution to tasks. Um, so they're not pre-programmed with that solution directly by the programmers. 
for all the designers. Um, instead of that, we create a system that can learn and then it experiences things and data and then it figures out for itself how to solve the problem. The second word, general, this is this notion of generality. So the idea that the same system or same single set of algorithms can operate out of the box across a wide range of tasks, potentially tasks that it's never even ever seen before. Um, now, of course, we have an example of a very powerful general purpose learning algorithm, and it's our brains, the human mind. And uh, um, uh, our brains are capable, of course, of doing both of these things, an exquisite example of, of this being possible. And up till now, uh, you know, our algorithms have not been able to do this. So the best computer science has to offer has fallen, and it still is, way short of um, what the mind can do. Now, internally at DeepMind, we call this type of AI artificial general intelligence, or AGI, to distinguish it from the traditional sort of AI um, that's been, you know, AI as a field has been going for um, 60, 70 years now, since the time of Alan Turing. And, um, and, you know, a lot of traditional AI is handcrafted. So this is specifically researchers and programmers coming up uh, with solutions to problems uh, and then directly codifying those solutions in, in terms of programs. And then the program itself, the machine just dumbly executes the program, the solution. It doesn't, it's, it doesn't adapt, it doesn't learn. And so the, the, the problem with those kinds of systems is they're very inflexible um, and they're very brittle. If something unexpected happens that the programmers didn't cater for beforehand, um, then it doesn't know what to do. So it just it usually just catastrophically fails. And this will be obvious to you if you've ever inter, you know, interacted with um, assistants on your phone. Um, often, you know, they'll be fine if you stick to the kind of script that they already understand. But once you start um, conversing them freely, you very quickly realize there isn't any real intelligence behind these systems. They're just template-based question answering systems. So um, by contrast, the hallmarks of AGI systems would be that they're flexible and they're adaptive and they're robust. Um, and what gives them this kind, these kind of properties are these general learning capabilities. So in terms of rule-based AI or traditional AI, the probably the still most famous example of that kind of system um, was Deep Blue, the IBM's uh, amazing chess computer that was able to beat uh, the world chess champion at the time, Gary Kasparov, in the late 90s. And uh, these kinds of systems are called expert systems, and, um, and they're pre-programmed uh, with all sorts of rules and heuristics to allow them to be experts in the particular type of task that they were built for. So in this case, Deep Blue was built to play chess. Now, the problem with these systems is, uh, and what you can quickly see is, that Deep Blue was not able to do anything else other than play chess. In fact, it couldn't even do um, something simpler, like play a strictly simpler game like noughts and crosses. It would have to be reprogrammed again from scratch. So I remember uh, uh, I, was, uh, I was doing my undergrad in Cambridge, actually, when this match happened. And I remember coming away from this match more impressed with Gary Kasparov's mind than I was with Deep Blue. And that's because, of course, Deep Blue was an incredible um, technical achievement and, and a big uh, landmark in AI research. But Gary was able to more or less compete equally with this um, brute of a machine. But of course, Gary Kasparov can do all sorts of other things, engage in politics, talk three languages, and write books, all of these other things that Deep Blue had no idea how to do um, with this single uh, uh, human mind. So to, to me, they felt like there was something um, critical missing from, if this was intelligence or AI, something missing from the Deep Blue system. And I think what was missing was this notion of um, adaptability and learning. So learning to cope with new uh, tasks or uh, new problems. And this idea of generality, being able to um, uh, operate across a wide range of very differing tasks. So the way we think about AI at DeepMind is um, in the framework of what's called reinforcement learning. And I'll just quickly sh uh, explain to you what reinforcement learning is uh, with the aid of this simple diagram. So if you think of the AI system, uh, and we call the, the AI systems agents at, uh, at DeepMind, internally at DeepMind, uh, here on the left, depicted by this, uh, this little character. And this agent finds itself in some kind of environment, and it's trying to achieve a goal in that environment, a goal specified by the designers in that environment. Now, if the environment was the real world, then uh, the agent, you can think of the agent as a robot. So a robot situated in a real world environment. 
Alternatively, the environment could be a virtual world, like a game environment, which is what we mostly use at DeepMind. And then in that case, you can think of the agent as like a virtual robot, kind of avatar or game character. Now, in either case, the agent only interacts with the environment in two ways. Firstly, it gets observations about the environment through its perceptual uh, inputs. Uh, we normally use vision, um, but we are starting to experiment with other modalities like sound and touch. Um, but for now, almost everything we use is, is vision input, so pixel input in the case of a simulation. And the first job of the agent is to build a model of the environment out there, statistical model of the environment, as accurately as it can, based on these uh, noisy, incomplete observations it's getting about the world out there. So it never has full information about how this environment works. It can only surmise and approximate it through the observations and the experience that it gets. The second job of the agent is, once it has that model of the environment and it's trying to make plans about uh, how to reach its goal, um, then it has a certain amount of time to pick the action it should take next um, and from the set of actions available to it at that moment in time. And it can do a lot of planning and thinking about if I do A, how will action A, how will the world look, how will the environment change, if I do action B, how will it change, which one of those actions will get me nearer towards its goal. And once it's uh, uh, run out of thinking time, it has to output the action, the best action it's found so far. That action gets executed. That may make a change or not make a change to the environment, which will then drive a new observation. So this whole system continues around in a kind of feedback loop. And all the time, the agent is trying to pick actions that will get it towards its goal, ultimately towards its goal. Now, this is, that's reinforcement learning in a nutshell and how it works. Um, now, we, it, this diagram is pretty simple, but there's a lot of very complex technicalities behind trying to solve this reinforcement learning problem in the fullest sense of the word. But we know that if we could solve all of these issues, technical issues, that with this framework is enough to deliver general intelligence. And we know that because this is the way biological systems learn, including uh, our human minds. So uh, in, the, in, the, in the primate brain and the human brain, uh, it's the dopamine neurons, the dopamine system in our brain that implements a form of reinforcement learning. So this is one of the methods that um, humans use to learn. The second big key piece of technology that's, that's, that's created this sort of new renaissance in AI in the last sort of decade is called deep learning. And um, deep learning is uh, to do with hierarchical neural networks. So they're kind of, you can think of them as loose approximations to the way our, uh, neuron, uh, neural, our real neural networks our, uh, work in our brain. And um, here's an example of, of a neural network working. So imagine that you're trying to train one of these neural networks here uh, on the right, this, these layers of neurons, to distinguish between pictures of cats and dogs. So what you would do is you would show these, this, this AI system many thousands, perhaps even millions, of different pictures of cats and different pictures of dogs. And uh, this is called supervised learning. So what you would do is you'd show them a picture. You, so you'd show the input layer at the bottom here, this picture, the raw pixels from this picture of a cat or a dog. And then uh, it would, the, 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 this neural network would process that picture and then would um, ultimately output a label, either a guess saying, I think that's a cat, or a guess saying, I think that's a dog. And depending on whether it was correct or incorrect, you would adjust, uh, the neural network adjusts the weights between these neurons so that next time you get asked a question about this is the cat or this is a dog, you're more likely to output the right answer. So, um, and it uses a, 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 an algorithm called backpropagation to do that. So it goes back and adjusts the neural network weights uh, depending whether you got the answer right or wrong so that you're more likely to get the answer right next time. And once you do this, this, this incremental learning process many thousands, perhaps even millions of times, eventually you get a neural network that is really amazing at distinguishing between pictures of cats and dogs. In fact, better than I am, because I actually can't tell whether that's a cat or a dog from that particular picture. So we, our, one of our big innovations at DeepMind was um, to pioneer the combination of these two types of algorithms. So, uh, so we, we call this uh, combination uh, rather logically deep reinforcement learning, and we use deep learning to process the perceptual inputs, to process the observations and make sense of the world out there, these, these visual inputs that the system is getting. And then we use reinforcement learning to make the decisions, to pick the right action to get the system towards its goal. 
So we pioneered this sort of field, and one of the big things that we, we, we demonstrated uh, was we built the world's first end-to-end -end learning system. And it's called DQM. And what we mean by end-to-end -end is it went all the way from perceptual, raw perceptual inputs, in this case pixels on a screen, to making a decision about what action to take. So really, it was an example of one of these uh, full systems that can uh, uh, go all the way uh, to, from processing the, the vision to making a plan and executing that plan. And what we tested it on uh, was Atari games. That was the first thing we tested on was Atari games from the 80s. Uh, and uh, we tested it on 50 classic games. Uh, for those of you in the audience who are old enough to remember these games, which is probably not many of you, uh, there were Space Invaders, Pac-Man, these kinds of games that I'm showing here at the bottom. And uh, I'm going to show you the, the, the DQN system, uh, ha how it learnt and how it progressed through its learning in a second in a video on the next uh, slide. But just before I show that, I just want to be clear what you're going to see. So the only input that the DQN system gets is the 20,000 pixel values uh, on the screen. So, um, so those, are the, those are the inputs that it gets, just these pixel numbers. It doesn't know anything about what it's supposed to be doing, what it's controlling. Um, all it knows is these are the pixel values and you've got to maximize the score. That was the goal. It has to learn everything else um, from scratch. So um, the architecture we use is, is, uh, is here on the screen here. So this is a neural network you can think of on its side. And uh, so on the left-hand side, you can see uh, there's the current screen being, uh, uh, be, and the pixels on the screen being used as the input. Then it gets processed through a number of layers. And then at the output, you've got um, a whole bunch of actions that can be taken. I think it's 19 actions that can be taken. Uh, the eight joystick movements, the eight joystick movements with the fire button uh, or, or doing nothing. And um, so it's got to make a decision about any of those actions to take in the next time step. Um, based on the current input, uh, screen input. So this is how it works on the classic game Breakout. Um, Breakout is one of the, uh, the most famous games in Atari games. Uh, and uh, here in this game, you control the, the bat and the ball, the pink bat at the bottom of the screen. And what you're trying to do is um, break through this rainbow color brick wall, brick by brick. And you're not supposed to let the ball go past your bat, otherwise you lose a life. So this is, I'm going to show you this video now of, of the agent learning after many hundreds of games of play. So this is DQN after 100 games. So you can see it's not very good agent yet. It's missing the ball most of the time. Um, but uh, it's starting to get the idea that it should move the bat towards the ball. Now this is after 300 games, so 200 more games experience. And now it's got pretty good at the game. It's about as good as any human can play the game. Uh, and it pretty much gets the ball back every time, um, even when the ball's going very fast at very, a very vertical angle. But then we let the, the, the system carry on playing for another 200 games. And then it did this amazing thing, which was it figured out the optimal strategy was to dig a tunnel around the left-hand side and then put the ball behind uh, the wall. So of course, this gets it more reward for less risk. Right? And of course, um, gets rid of the rainbow color brick wall more quickly. And, and that was for, for us really our first big sort of aha moment, what watershed moment at DeepMind. Uh, this is now from four or five years ago. And we realized we were onto something with these kinds of techniques. It was able to discover something new that even the programmers and the brilliant researchers of that system did not know how to do. We didn't know, we you know, hadn't thought about that solution to the game. So then more recently, a couple of years ago, we started work on what is probably still our most famous uh, program, a program called AlphaGo. And um, AlphaGo was a system to play the ancient board game, uh, Chinese board game of Go. So this is what Go looks like, um, for those who don't know. And this is what they play in China and Korea and Japan uh, instead of chess. And um, Go is actually a very simple game. There's only th um, two rules, basically, and I could teach you with it in five minutes, but it takes at least a lifetime, sometimes some would say many lifetimes, to master the game. And the aim of the game is, the game ends, this is an end position from the end of the game, People, um, so there's two players, uh, black and white, and they take turns putting stones on the board. And eventually when the game, the board fills up like this, you end up counting how many um, areas of territory did you wall off with your stones. Uh, and the person that has, uh, the side that has walled off the most amount of territory, the most amount of squares with their stones, wins the game. So in this case, uh, it's a very close game and white wins by one point. Now the question is, why is this so hard, go so hard for computers to play? 
you know, I just told you at the beginning of the talk that chess was solved, uh, was, was, was cracked sort of 20 years ago. Uh, and then since then, Go has been one of the holy grails for AI research. Um, and it's much, much harder. And uh, there, there's two real reasons, uh, two main reasons why uh, Go has been much harder than chess. One is uh, the huge search space uh, that you need to, the, the huge number of possibilities in Go. So there are actually 10 to the power 170 possible positions in Go, which is way more than there are atoms in the universe. There's about 10 to the power 80 atoms in the observable universe. So what that means is if you um, ran all the world's computers for a million years, uh, on calculating all the positions, you still wouldn't be having, uh, have calculated through all the possibilities in Go. There's just too many to do through brute force. And the second and even harder thing about Go is that it was thought to be impossible to explicitly write down by hand uh, what's called an evaluation function. So that's a function that takes a board position and tells the computer which side is winning and by how much. And that's a critical part of how the chess programs work. Um, that's why Deep Blue was so powerful. Uh, a team of chess grandmasters with brilliant programmers at IBM put, came together and the programmers distilled what was in the minds of the chess grandmasters and tried to distill that into an evaluation function that would allow the Deep Blue system and its successors to evaluate whether the current position was good or not. And then that's what's used to plan out what move you should take. And in Go, this is thought to be impossible because the, the game is too esoteric. Um, uh, that, 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 that it's, it's too um, almost artistic in a way uh, to be able to evaluate in that sense with um, hard and fast rules. And if you talk to a professional Go player, they'll tell you the game is a lot more about intuition and feeling than it is about calculation, uh, which is a, a game more like chess, which is more about explicit calculation and planning. So we made this um, big breakthrough with AlphaGo, and the way we were able to do this is we tackled those two problems, this, this problem of combinatorial explosion and huge search spaces, and this problem of evaluation function uh, with two neural networks. So the first neural network we used was called a policy network. And what we did here was we fed in um, board positions from um, strong amateur games that we downloaded off the internet. And we trained a neural network to predict the next move the human player would make. So uh, in blue here is the board, uh, the current board position with the black and white stones on it. And then what the output is, um, another board, uh, but here with probabilities that AlphaGo thought for each possible move in the position. So the higher the green bar, the higher probability it would give to a human player playing that move. And what this policy network allowed the system to do is rather than look at all the possible moves in the current position uh, and then all the possible replies to those possible moves, and you can imagine how quickly that escalates, it can instead look at the top three or four most likely uh, and most probable moves uh, rather than the hundreds of possible moves that you could make. So that massively reduces down the, the breadth of the search tree. The second thing we did was we created a, what's called a, we called a value network. And uh, what we did is we took the policy network and we played it against itself uh, uh, millions of times. So AlphaGo played against itself millions of times. And uh, we took get random positions from the middle of those games. And we, of course, know the result of the game, which side won. And we trained AlphaGo to make a prediction about um, from the current position about who would end up winning the game and how certain uh, AlphaGo was about its prediction. So, uh, and eventually, once we trained it through uh, millions of positions, um, it, was, it was able to create a very uh, accurate um, evaluation function, this value network. And what this value network did is took a current ball position, again in blue here at the bottom of the screen, and output a single real number between zero and one. And zero meant white was going to win, 100% chance, 100% uh, confidence in that. A one would mean black was going to win, 100% confidence in that. And 0.5 would mean the position, AlphaGo judged the position to be equal. And so here, if, by combining these two neural networks, we solved all of the hard problems inherent in computer Go. Uh, and what you'll notice, instead of us building an explicit evaluation function like they do for chess programs, you know, typing in all these hundreds of different rules. So in fact, modern chess, uh, uh, chess computers have, you know, the order of about a thousand specific rules about chess uh, and about positions in chess. Um, instead of that, we didn't have any explicit rules. We just let the system learn for itself through experience by playing the game against itself uh, many thousands, uh, indeed millions of times. 
So once we had uh, uh, this system, we decided to challenge one of the greatest players in the world, um, an incredible South Korean grandmaster called Lee Sedol. Uh, and I describe him as the Roger Federer of Go, because um, that's the equivalent position he, he, he occupies. You know, he's won 18 world titles, a bit like Grand Slams, and he's considered to be the greatest player of the past decade. And uh, we challenged uh, Lisa Dole to a match, uh, a $1 million challenge match in South Korea, in Seoul, in, back in 2016. And it was an amazing, uh, you know, once in a lifetime experience, actually. And the whole country pretty much came to standstill. One thing you've got to know about South Korea is they love AI, they love technology, and they love Go. So for them, this was like the biggest confluence of all the, the things they find exciting altogether. And, and Lisa Dole is a, is, a, is a sort of national hero there. Um, he's equivalent of like, you know, David Beckham or something with us. So, um, so, that's, so that, that was an incredible experience. You know, this is, this is a picture at the top left of the first press conference. You know, it's literally a huge ballroom full of, full of journalists and TV cameras. And, um, you know, the, there was over 200 million viewers across Asia for the five game match, uh, which is incredible. And AlphaGo, we won 4-1 the match. Uh, and, you know, it was hugely unexpected. Um, even just before the match, uh, uh, Lisa Dole was asked to predict what he thought was going to happen. He predicted a 5-0 uh, victory for himself or 4-1 at minimum. And in fact, it was proclaimed to be a decade before its time, both by AI experts, uh, including computer Go experts, and, um, and also Go players and the Go world. Uh, and the, the important thing here was not just the fact that AlphaGo won, but actually it was how AlphaGo won that was the critical thing. So um, AlphaGo actually played lots of creative, completely new moves and, and came up with lots of new ideas that astounded the Go world. And in fact, are still being studied now, you know, nearly two years later uh, and are revolutionizing the game. So it's not a question of AlphaGo just learning about human uh, uh, heuristics and, and, uh, and motifs, and then just regurgitating those motifs, uh, uh, um, reliably sort of regurgitating them, it actually created its own uh, uh, unique ideas. And here's the most famous example of that I just want to quickly show you. Um, this is move 37 in game two. And uh, in Go, there is a whole history. Go has been, go, uh, uh, has been around for 3,000 years. And, um, and was played professionally for several hundred years uh, in Japan and China and other places. And uh, there is this notion in Go of famous games that are looked or back on and studied for hundreds of years. And indeed, famous moves in those famous games sort of go down in history. And uh, this is considered to be, you know, kind of following that lineage, this, this move, move 37 from game two. And uh, this is the move here on the right-hand side. And um, the AlphaGo here is black and Lisa Doll is white. And uh, when AlphaGo played this move, Lisa Dole sort of literally fell off his chair. And the reason is, and all the commentators commentating it thought this was a terrible move. And, um, and the reason for that is that uh, in the early parts of Go, uh, uh, in the opening phases of the Go game, you normally play on the third and fourth lines. So Go is played on a 19 by a 19 board, and you normally play on the third and fourth lines. And that's the kind of accepted wisdom uh, of, of, of how you should play in the opening. Those are kind of the critical lines. But here, you'll notice that AlphaGo played this relatively early move, move 37 is still very early in the game, on the fifth line. So one line further up. And this is normally considered to be a huge mistake because you're giving White, your opponent, a um, huge amount of territory on the side of the board. So it's considered to be sort of a, a, a very weak move. So it's the sort of thing no professional would ever consider playing. And the key thing about um, uh, what AlphaGo did here is that it played this move and um, the thing about Go is, it's in, in Asia, it's considered to be kind of like an art form, but it's sort of objective art because you know later on, any one of us could come up with an original move. We could just play a random move and it might be original. But the key thing of whether it is, is did it make a difference and impact the game, the result of the game? That's what determines whether it's a kind of beautiful and uh, truly creative move. And in fact, move 37 did exactly that because you'll see the two stones here that I've outlined in the bottom left they're surrounded by white stones, so they're in big trouble. But later on, about 100 moves later on, the, the, the fighting that was going on in the bottom left-hand corner spilled out into the center of the board, ran across all the way across the board, and ended up, those two stones down the bottom left ended up joining up with that move 37 stone. And it was that, that third, move 37 stone was in exactly the right place to decide that whole battle, which ended up winning AlphaGo that game. 
So it was almost as if um, uh, AlphaGo placed that stone presciently 100 moves earlier to impact this um, fight elsewhere off the board at exactly the right moment. So, um, so this is really you know, quite an astounding moment uh, for Go and, and Computer Go. Uh, Lisa Doll himself was incredibly gracious and an absolute genius. And um, what was really amazing was he, he, he won a game and it was an incredible game that he won. He made an amazing move too. And he said afterwards he was very inspired by the match. You know, I realized it was a really good choice learning to play Go. This is amazing. It's all of the reason he played Go, and it's been an unforgettable experience. And he actually went on a three-month unbeaten winning streak uh, in, in human championship matches uh, after this match with AlphaGo. Uh, and he was trying out all sorts of new ideas and techniques. And if you're interested in that, I'd recommend you, if you want to see the behind-the-scenes story, um, I'd recommend you watch uh, this documentary that was done in, by an independent filmmaker and won all sorts of awards at film festivals that's now available on Netflix, um, so which, will, which will really give you a sort of behind-the-scenes uh, look at how AlphaGo was created uh, and what went into it. So since then, we've continued working on these kinds of systems, and, um, and now uh, we've created a new program called AlphaZero, uh, which uh, advances what we did in AlphaGo and takes it to the next level. So what we've done with AlphaZero, and we just released this just before Christmas, um, was we've generalized AlphaGo to be able to play not just Go now, but any two-player game, including chess and uh, Shogi, which is uh, the Japanese version of chess, both of which are played professionally around the world. And, uh, and the second thing we did to generalize it further, so it plays more than one game, so don't forget, this gets at the notion of generality. So that was something I, I criticized about Deep Blue. Deep Blue could only, that program could only play chess. Well, AlphaZero can play any two-player game. Um, the second thing is that we, we remove this need, like in AlphaGo, if you remember what I said about the policy network, is it first trained to mimic human amateur, strong amateur players that we, we'd shown it from the internet. Um, but instead of that, what AlphaZero does is it starts completely from scratch. So it's, it can only relies on self-learning, playing against itself. So it starts off, when it begins, totally randomly. So it knows nothing about the game or anything about what are good moves or, or likely moves. It has to learn all of that literally starting from random. So it doesn't require any um, human data to, to bootstrap its learning. And uh, we tested this program uh, in chess, of course, there are many already uh, very, very strong chess programs, way stronger than the human world champion. Uh, the current uh, top program is called Stockfish, and uh, it's an open source program, and uh, you, can, um, you can think of it as the descendant of Deep Blue 20 years later. So it's, it's way, way stronger now, and you can run it on your laptop. And it's so strong, no human player ha would have a chance of beating it. And it's, in fact, many of my chess player friends, and I used to play chess when I was a lot younger, um, uh, thought that Stockfish could never be beaten. Like that was, the, that was the limit at which chess could be played. And amazingly, AlphaZero, after just four hours of training, so it started off random, and then after four hours of this self-playing uh, self um, and a few million games, it was able to beat Stockfish 28-0 uh, with 72 draws in a 100-game match. So um, it was really quite astounding result, uh, again, for the AI world, but also um, for the chess world. And um, we're actually going to publish, we've just released preliminary data on this, and we're going to publish this on a, in a big peer-reviewed journal uh, in the next few months. And again here, just like with Go, where it came up with these new motifs that, you know, playing on the fifth line in the opening, that um, for thousands, over, sort of overturned thousands of years of received wisdom, uh, human wisdom, here in chess, even more, more amazingly, was that it, it created, it seems to have invented a new style of playing chess. Um, you know, and, and the summary of that is that it favors mobility and uh, the, the, the amount of mobility your pieces have over materiality. So in most chess programs, you know, the way that you write chess code, one of the first rules you, you input into a chess program is the value of the pieces. You know, rook is five points, knight is three points, bishop is three points. And so obviously you don't want to swap your rook for a knight because that's minus two points, right? So that's one of the very first things we'll put into the very first chess computers, those kinds of rules. And what um, an alpha zero actually is very contextual. So in certain positions, it will be very happy to sacrifice material to gain mobility, 
So the remaining pieces it has to increase their power on the board. And what that means is it can make incredible sacrifices uh, to gain positional advantage, um, really long-term sacrifices. And, uh, and we released 10 sample games from this 100 game match. And these are being poured over by chess grandmasters at the moment. And uh, there's lots of great YouTube commentaries on this. If you're an amateur chess player, and you're interested in chess, I recommend you, 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 you um, have a look at a few of these great commentaries on, on YouTube uh, that talk about why these games, uh, this style, this alpha zero style is, is so interesting. And what's and secondly interesting about it is a lot of these professional chess players commented on how AlphaZero seemed to have a much more human style than um, the top chess programs uh, that have a such much more kind of uh, mechanical style and it's a little bit ugly to the human eye, uh, the way that computer chess programs um, sort of play uh, until now. Now, so these are some of the, 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 the breakthroughs that we've had, and um, there are many other breakthroughs in many other domains from, from other groups around the world. And AI right now has you know, become a huge buzzword and with uh, a massive amount of progress has been made in the last uh, five to 10 years. But um, I don't wanna give you the impression is that we're anywhere close to yet to solving um, AI. Uh, there's actually tons of key challenges that remain. In fact, it's a very exciting time. In some senses, I feel like we've, all we've done is, is dealt with the preliminaries. And now we're getting to the heart of what intelligence is. And I'll just give you a little taste of some of the things that, that I'm personally thinking about and that my team is. And each one of these things would be a whole lecture in itself. And indeed, I think some of the other lecturers in the uh, speakers in this lecture series will probably cover some of these topics. So unsupervised learning is a key challenge that is not solved yet. So this is what I've been showing you is supervised learning where like the cats and dogs, where I tell you the system the answer so that it tries to figure out how to adjust itself so that it's more likely to get the right answer. And uh, I've also showed you about reinforcement learning where you get a score or a reward. So in Go, you get the, the machine gets a one for winning and a zero, zero reward for losing, right? And it wants to get reward. But what about the situation where you don't have any rewards and you also don't know the correct answer, which in fact is most of the time. In fact, when we do human learning and babies learn, uh, most of the time they're not getting any feedback and yet they're still learning things for themselves. So how does that happen? So that's called unsupervised learning. Second thing is memory in one shot learning. So uh, what I've shown you is systems that are in the moment. So they, they process currently what's in front of them. They make a decision in the moment and then they execute that decision. What you, what, of course, to have true intelligence, you need to remember what you've done in the past and how that affects your future plans, right? And you also need to be able to learn much more efficiently. So I've told you about AlphaGo. You know, AlphaGo needs to play millions of games against itself to learn to get to this level. Um, but humans can learn much more quickly, right? We are able to learn things sometimes in one shot, just one example, and that's enough. And that's something, both of those things, are, they're kind of related. Uh, and actually, this is what I studied for, uh, as Andy mentioned, in, for my neuroscience PhD, was how the brain does this. And it's actually a brain error called the hippocampus, which is what I studied for my PhD and is critical to um, both one-shot learning and episodic memory. Another thing is imagination-based planning. So, um, so one thing is to sort of plan by trying out possibilities like in chess or Go. You know, it's quite simple. Go, although Go's have got lots of possibilities, the game itself dynamics is very simple. You know, you, you, the rules are simple. You know what will happen if you make a move, then how the next state will look. Of course, the real world is much more complicated, is, is very complicated. And uh, it's is not easy to figure out what's going to happen next when you, when you make an action. So uh, this is where uh, you know, imagination comes in. This is how we make plans as humans is we imagine viscerally like how we might want a you know, job interview to go or a lunch uh, or a party or something like that. We actually kind of visualize it in our minds. And then that allows us to adjust, oh, what if I, if I said this thing or if I did this thing, then how would this other person react and so on? And we play these through these scenarios through in our minds before we actually get to the situation. And that's an extremely efficient way to do planning. Uh, and it's something that we need in our AI systems. Learning abstract concepts. So what I've shown you here is implicit knowledge. So kind of figuring out what this perceptual world's about. But what we really need to learn is about abstractions, uh, at high level concepts, and eventually things like language and mathematics, which we're nowhere near uh, currently. Transfer learning is another key thing, which is where you um, take some knowledge you've learned about it from one domain and you apply it to a totally new uh, domain. So that might look perceptually completely different, but actually underlying structure of that domain is the same as some other domain that you've experienced. 
Uh, again, uh, uh, our computer systems are, are not good at doing this kind of learning, but humans are exceptionally good at this. And then finally, of course, um, all the things I've shown you here, games, Atari games, Go games, chess games, uh, none of them yet involve language, which as we all know is key to intelligence. So that's a whole air field um, that still needs to be uh, uh, addressed uh, with these kinds of techniques. So um, I just want to talk a little bit now about uh, how this is being already applied, even the systems we have today. So there's many challenges to come, but I think already the systems we have today can be usefully used in science. Um, in fact, we've seen that um, by uh, work we've done, some work we've done, and many other groups are using some of these systems I've already talked about, deep learning and reinforcement learning, uh, in all sorts of very interesting scientific domains. So it's been used to discover new exoplanets by analyzing data from telescopes. Uh, AI systems have been used for controlling plasma in nuclear fusion reactors. Um, we've been working on, uh, and others, on um, how it can help with quantum chemistry problems. Uh, and also it's been used a lot in, in, in healthcare domains. So actually we have a um, partnership with Morefields um, to help uh, 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 the radiographers uh, quickly triage uh, 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 retinopathy scans, so scans of the retina to look for macular degeneration. So um, it was very, very full, extremely diverse fields. And I could have you know, done many slides on different applications that are currently going on with AI. And I think this is just the beginning. One of the things I'm most excited about is applying it to the problem of protein folding. So this is the, this is the problem of you get an amino acid sequence, uh, 2D sequence of, of the protein structure, and you need to figure out the 3D structure the protein will eventually fold into. And that's really key to a lot of um, disease and drug discovery because the, the 3D structure of the protein governs how it will behave. Um, so this is a huge uh, uh, sort of long-standing scientific challenge in biology, and uh, we're working quite hard uh, with a project team on, on this uh, with some collaborators from the Crick. Uh, uh, other scientific applications I see coming up is helping with things like drug design, the design of new materials, uh, and uh, in biotechnology in areas like genomics. And in fact, if I was to boil down the kinds of problems, the properties of problems that are well suited to the AI we already have today, let alone what we're going to create in the future, I think it comes down to three prop key properties. Property one, um, it's got to be a massive combinatorial search space. So, um, uh, so that's kind of got to be inherent in the, in the problem. Secondly, can you specify a clear objective function or metric to hill climb against, to optimize against. It's almost like a score, if you like, a score in a game. You have to be able to have some kind of score of how well you're doing uh, towards the final goal. And then you either need lots of data to learn from, actual real data, or an accurate and efficient simulation or simulator so you can generate a lot of data uh, in the way that we do with our game systems. So as long as you satisfy those three constraints, uh, uh, properties, I think we, all, the AI systems we already have today could potentially be usefully deployed in those areas. And I think there's actually a lot of areas in science that already uh, would fit these, uh, these, these desired properties. And then, of course, um, there's all sorts of applications to the real world that we're working on uh, in combination with Google, uh, including with healthcare. We work with the NHS in, in many uh, projects. Um, you're making the assistant on the phone more intelligent, uh, and also in areas like education uh, and personalized education. Um, and, and I think AI is set to um, revolutionize a lot of these um, other sectors. So just to sort of um, sum up now, you know, one of the reasons that I've um, spent my whole career about on, on AI is that um, I've always felt that it's a kind of meta solution to many other problems that, that face us today. You know, if you think about um, how the world is today, one of the big challenges is the amount of information that we're confronted with um, and that we're producing as a society. So, and I mean that both in our personal lives in terms of like choosing, you know, uh, 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 our entertainment to uh, science where there's just so much data now being produced from something like CERN or in genomics. You know, how do we make sense of it all? And indeed, the, the, the systems that we would like to understand better and have more control over are incredibly complex systems. Uh, you know, think about climate or the, the nuclear fusion systems. You know, these incredibly uh, complex systems that are, 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 in some cases, are bordering on uh, chaos systems. Uh, and so they're very difficult for us to describe with equations and to understand, even the top um, uh, human scientists and experts. So, you know, for a long time, big data was 
uh, the buzzword. You know, before AI was is now the buzzword. AI was the you know big big data was the buzzword. And I think that actually, in a way, big data can be seen as the problem. Uh, you know, if you think about it from an industry point of view, everybody you know all companies have tons of data now and talk about big data. The problem is how do they get the insights out of that data and how do they make use of all of that data uh, so to be useful to their customers and their clients uh, and so on. And I think AI is the answer um, to help uh, find the structure and insights in all of that uh, unstructured data. And in fact, you can think of, I think one way to think about intelligence is as a process, an automatic process that converts unstructured information into useful, actionable knowledge. And um, you know, I think AI could be sort of help us automate that process. And for me, my personal dream and a lot of the dream of, the, of my team is to make AI-assisted science possible, uh, or even perhaps create AI scientists that can work in tandem with um, their, their human expert counterparts. And from a neuroscience point of view, one of my dreams as well is to try and better understand our own human minds. And I think building AI in this neuroscience-inspired way, and then and then sort of comparing that, that construct, that algorithmic construct with the way the human mind works will potentially shed some light, I think, on some of the unique properties of our own minds, things like creativity, dreaming, um, perhaps even the big question of consciousness. So to sum up then, I think you know, AI holds enormous promise for the future, and I think these are incredibly exciting times to sort of be alive and working in these fields. But you know, this is, with all this sort of potential also comes a lot of responsibility. And I just want to mention this, and I think some of you will probably have questions about this later. You know, we believe at DeepMind, as with all powerful technologies, AI must be built responsibly and safely and used for the benefit of everyone in society. And we've been thinking about that from the very beginning of DeepMind. And this requires lots of things that we're actively engaged with right now with the wider community. Research on the impact of the technology, how to control this technology and deploy it, and we need a diversity of voices, both in the development and the use of the technology and meaningful public engagement, which is why we're so happy to be supporting this lecture series. And we've just launched our own ethics and society team at DeepMind that's involved in working with many outside sort of stakeholders to figure out the best way to go about um, deploying and using these types of technologies to benefit everyone in society. And we've also been involved uh, on industry scale across the whole field in uh, co-founding the Partnership on AI, which is a cross-industry collaboration with for-profit and non-profit companies. Um, some of the biggest companies in the world coming together to talk about this and try and agree some best practices uh, and, some, and, and some protocols around how to, uh, how to research this technology and, and how to engage the public with it. And all this is happening uh, you know, for us right here in the center in the heart of London. Um, you know, our home, we're a very proudly British company. And, um, you know, we work here at King's Cross uh, with our colleagues at the Crick Institute and the Ch Alan Turing Institute, which is based in the British Library, all around. And King's Cross is becoming quite a hotbed, uh, and UCL, of course, is around there, of a AI research. And, uh, you know, as Andy mentioned at the start, we, we should leverage in the UK all of our incredible strengths, these amazing universities that we have here, Oxford, Cambridge, UCL, Imperial, and others, that have incredible strength in computer science. And uh, we, you know, I feel very strongly that DeepMind needs to play its part in encouraging and supporting this AI ecosystem through sponsorships, scholarships, and internships, and, and, and actually lectures given by DeepMind staff. Uh, and I'm very passionate about establishing the UK as one of the world leaders in AI, and I think we have an amazing position. And we've, we should really be building on our heritage in computing that starts with, you know, actually Charles Babbage uh, inventing computing, really, 100 years before, his time, before, before its time in some senses. And then, of course, that continued with Alan Turing, who famously laid down the fundamentals of computing in the 40s and 50s. Then the World Wide Web, you know, with, with people like Sir Tim Berners-Lee, uh, instrumental in creating um, the Internet. And I feel like you know, the next thing in the lineage of those, of those types of technologies, artificial general intelligence. And I think the UK has a huge part to play in that, and I hope DeepMind will, will play its part in that too. So you know, it's great to be opening uh, this, uh, this series of lectures. Um, you know, I think we, we need to capitalize on, on, on what we have here in the UK, both um, you know, from the ethical side and the technological side. And one thing I would say is that it's important for us to be at the forefront of technology if we want to have a seat at the table when it comes to influencing the debate on, on the ethical use of this technology. Um, and again, I would encourage you all to get involved, the public, you know, understand these technologies better and how they're going to affect society, and then engage on how you would like to see uh, uh, these technologies deployed for, for the benefit of everyone. 
you know, I think AI can be of incredible benefit to society if we use it responsibly. I think it could be one of the most exciting and transformative um, technologies we'll ever invent. Thanks for listening. Thanks, so, folks, we have uh, time for uh, questions and, and, and so on. But let me start off with uh, 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 a question just to get things uh, going. Uh, you've outlined some of the technological uh, possibilities. What are the barriers? What are the difficulties? What stands in the way on the you know, deployment, the use, the science uh, mm -hmm. of this, some of the things you've talked about? Yeah, I think... Um you know, I, I mentioned in the slide about uh, what the remaining challenges are. I think that, that, you know, it's important to remember that there are uh, lots of very difficult things about intelligence we still don't know how to do, right? So, um, you know, I think I outlined some of those key areas. Um, we're working hard on that and many others are too, but we don't know how quickly those solutions will come. I think there's going to require some really big breakthroughs are still needed, um, at least as big as the ones we've had uh, and possibly many of those. So I think that's to come over the next few years. In terms of the barriers to sort of using them, you know, I think we have to think very carefully about how we, you know, we want to test these kinds of systems. Because in a sense, these systems are adaptive and they learn. So it's a very new type of software in a way, right? So software generally, as you know better, better than most, Andy, is you know, we, we write some software and then you test it and you stress test it and unit test it. And there's all these ways of testing software. And then you know if um, it's ready to be shipped and deployed. And out it goes. And you know it's going to behave the way you want. Now, of course, one of the advantages of our systems is when you, send them, when you put them out in the world, they'll continue to adapt and learn and, and uh, to the new situations they encounter that you may not have thought of. But then the question is, how do you make sure they still behave the way you want them to? Um, and how do you test that kind of system? So I actually see that as a big challenge. Just if I can be a little light-hearted uh, in flying, uh, I'm told uh, uh, a common phrase from one pilot to another is, what's it doing now? So uh, uh, maybe it's a little bit of that sort of, uh, yes. <laughs> that sort of stuff. Uh, so questions, please. Uh, uh, let's start off at the front here, lady, right at the front. Uh, <coughs> there's a microphone coming uh, uh, very quickly to you. Hi, it's, oh, is that one? Yeah, sorry. Margie Murphy from The Telegraph, hi. Um, so I've got a question um, about sort of the implications AI may have in democracy further down the line. So a lot of what you talked about was predicting human behavior. Are, do you think that there's a legitimate concern around predicting human behavior at scale, um, potentially manipulating people, serving them political advertising, um, or even with private corporations, perhaps gambling or gaming, where you have to pay to level up. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm not sure I did talk about predicting human behavior, but um, so, yes, yeah, so, so we, what we're talking about here is, if you're referring to the kind of Facebook stuff, I mean, we're talking about finding structure in any kind of data. So I'm thinking more about um, scientific data that you've, you've got, or, uh, you know, in the case of our stuff, the gaming data. So. Um, it playing against itself and generating its own data and then finding parts. You can think of it as like an intelligent search. So you've got this huge combinatorial space and you want to try and find, say, a new material design or a new drug design or indeed a new go position. And how do you efficiently search through all of that, that amount of data? And what you've got to find is um, structures and patterns that can help you reduce the size of that search. Really, that's what you can think of out of zero and alpha go doing. Um, and that's where we are at the moment. And of course, you know, eventually these systems could predict all sorts of things potentially. But um, right now, I mean, the first thing you want to do is get, get the data into some kind of format that you can actually express. Um, and the second thing is kind of um, an objective function, some kind of goal that you want this, the system to do. So I think, um, you know, it's quite different to the kinds of goals that, say, Facebook has with, with its systems. Yeah. Very good. So I have a question from uh, downstairs. Uh, I'm afraid I don't know who it comes from, but uh, here it is. Uh, I'll paraphrase. Uh, humans are irrational. What's the approach? Approach? How do you approach uh, a, an automatic system which has to deal with some uh, level of irrationality? Sure. Well, I think, um, in fact, that's, that's one of the most tricky things about uh, uh, a lot of systems, like economics, I think, is one of the most difficult uh, areas of science because... 
uh, it really is a, 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 a sort of aggregate of human behavior, right? And, and of course, uh, they will tell you better than most scientists about, about human irrationality and how that impacts things. I mean, I think what we've got, what potentially we have here is systems that, um, you know, can be quite rational. And then we've got to think about uh, what aspects of irrationality do they need to model, if at all, to understand the systems? At some point, probably, they're going to need something, you know, I can imagine they're going to need to understand if they're going to interact with human experts and, and, and human systems, uh, you know, a little bit to empathize about how humans behave and what they can expect from them. But I don't think, um, you know, I think part of the power of these systems is that they could be uh, very rational systems. Maybe an earlier career person, a gentleman uh, halfway down uh, with his hand up. I wouldn't like to say whether you're earlier career or not. But, uh, <laughs> Off you go. Yeah, kind of early career. <laughs> Mid-career, probably. Um, Who are you? Sorry. Uh, Michael Ferguson, uh, startup founder. Um, so there's this discussion between Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg about uh, the threat AI poses to humanity. Um, so firstly, what are your thoughts on that? But from a personal perspective, it just seems crazy to me because, I mean, what are we exactly worried about? Are we worried about a system we can't turn off? Are we worried about a Westworld-type scenario where there's AI running around us, manipulating us? Um, it just seems so far off when, at the moment, we're just talking about games. We're not talking about the complexity that you discussed towards the end of your lecture. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think... Uh you know, that's why I try to make emphasize, we, although there's been some impressive breakthroughs, we are still at a nascent stage. And uh, we are talking about just, you know, board games and things like that at the moment. But I think my view is a sort of somewhere in between that debate that you're talking about. So just for those of you who don't know, Elon has, has sounded the alarm bell a lot about uh, the dangers of AI um, and ex sort of existential risks of AI. And then Mark uh, Zuckerberg replied kind of that there aren't any. And um, we should worry about that, and it's all sort of roses. Um, and I think, actually, the, the, the real answer comes somewhere in between. Um, my view is that uh, we need a lot more research uh, has to be done about the, the, what these systems are and what their capabilities could be. So, you know, what type of systems we'd want to design, right? I think a lot of these things, are, because we're very early still, uh, are unknown. So, um, you know, and, and, and I think a lot of the things people worry about are going to get a lot better. So, for example, the interpretability of these systems. This is one thing that I get often asked is, well, you know, how does AlphaGo play Go, right? And we don't know that yet. It's a big neural network and it's a, it's a little bit like our brains. You know, we, we roughly know what it's doing, but actually the specifics, it's not like a normal program where you can point to it and go like, this bit of code is doing this. And uh, for safety critical systems, perhaps in healthcare and others, you know, if it was to control a plane, you know, you'd actually want to know exactly what, why the decision was made, right? And be able to track that back for accountability uh, and make sure there's no bias and for fairness and all these other things. And these are, this is very active area research and we, we, we have a whole team that researches this. And um, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, I think things will get a lot better on that front in the next five plus years. It's because we're at the very beginning of even having these systems working that's why we don't yet know how to build visualization tools and other things, but I think we will do. Um, having said that, you know, that there are, uh, uh, you know, we got to make sure, like, it's a very, very powerful technology. The reason I, I work on it is because I think it's going to have this amazing transformative uh, effect on the world for the better in things like science and techno you know, technology and medicine. But, um, you know, like all powerful technologies, it depends. I think the technology itself is neutral but it depends on what we as a society decide to use it for. You know, obviously if we decide to use it, it could be used for things like weapons and that would be terrible. And we've signed many letters to the effect that there shouldn't be autonomous weapon systems. There should always be human decision maker in the loop and so on. But that, that's really a political decision and a societal decision, which is why it's important we have debates like this, because in my view, no, nobody should be building those kinds of systems. But that's, that's gonna require you know, UN agreement and things like this. So I actually think those are the things that we should be worrying about near term. And the sorts of things I just mentioned to Andy is like, if we're gonna have self-driving cars, well, maybe we should test them before putting them on the road and like beta testing them live, you know, on the road, which is sort of what's happening now. Is that responsible really? 
And, and the question, and then, and then the sort of technical question is, how do you ensure uh, mathematically, in some sense, those systems are safe and they'll only do what you think they're going to do when they're going to be, you know, out in the wild and, uh, you know, they're adaptable learning systems. So the, I think these are kind of technical questions. So I don't think, I certainly don't think there's nothing to worry about. And I definitely think it's worth worrying about it now, even though um, I think it's many, many decades away before, you know, the sorts of things Elon's worried about will, will come to pass if, if ever. And I think we have plenty of time to make sure that doesn't. Um, but I think we need to be thinking about it now uh, and not just the researchers, but society at large. At the back, perhaps. Uh... There's a lady whose hand is up uh, uh, there. Yes, uh, oh, thank I'm you very much. Old people I'm a female. <laughs> no, no, it's late career, maybe? I don't That's know. That's right. Mid, mid career. I don't use the word old. Um, I, I run Society Inside, which is a, a not for profit looking at cross technology learning from biotech, GM, uh, quantum tech uh, uh, recently. And one of the um, areas we're looking at at the moment is this concept of trust in governance. And the lessons of past tech is that technologies are so overexcited about themselves that they slightly resist the governance. And we see that happening in AI at the moment. So I would be really interested to know, given the, the, the breadth of, of the places that AI will be applied, what your views on, on the trustworthiness of governance and the work that you're going to be doing on governance. Yeah, so we, we engage with government um, quite regularly, uh, all gov uh, lots of governments actually, not just the UK government. And I think it's really important in this phase for them to get up to speed with what's actually going on technically and the, the, the sorts of questions that they should be thinking about and, and, and wrestling with. And uh, it's not that I don't think there's anything that, you know, it needs to be done now. In fact, I think that would be bad if there was some kind of knee jerk regulation or something like that, because I think even if you were to, if I was to wave, or you were to ask me like wave a wand, what would you regulate? We don't know as researchers, because we don't actually know what the, the right protocols are, or the right safety mechanisms, or the right control mechanisms are. It's still an active area of research, but that's coming down the line. And um, when, that, when we do have some kind of agreement around that, you know, then I could imagine some sort of regulation around that. We've and got that self-driving cars though already. Yes, so, so exactly. So, we, so, that, so, that's, so that's with AGI, so general AI, what I was talking about. In terms of specific deployed things, I think what we need to do is upgrade our current existing regulations that we have, say, in transport or in healthcare. We already, you know, there's already a lot of regulation around those areas, but they need to be upgraded to deal with the new technologies that are coming in. And I think that's actually what we should be focusing on now is, 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 is improving those regulations so that they can actually cope with uh, the, the, the new world that's coming very fast. Uh, and I think we have already have um, committees and organizations that, 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 and departments that are well capable of doing that with the right advice from, from experts. Young person right in front here. Uh, very early career. Very early career. <laughs> or a genius in yes. which case is mid career. <laughs> mid -career. <laughs> so first of all, I would like to thank you for the wonderful presentation. Yes. I understood everything, luckily. Oh, great. Well, see, definitely him a genius a job. then. Yeah. Yeah, so, a job. my question is, what's your vision for DeepMind? What do you think its part will be in the future of AI? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I, I hope it will play um, like a, a major part in the research. So, I hope that we will um, accelerate and progress some of the big breakthroughs that I talked about that are still left to be done, like how concepts are done or memory, these things. I hope that DeepMind will be a big part of discovering that. And then the second thing is I'd like us to be a beacon for the ethical use of AI and to make sure that, like, sort of be a role model, if you like, for other companies and other organizations as to how they should approach thinking about the ethical questions and the, and the philosophical questions behind um, AI and, and how we use it. Very good. Okay, we'll go to the lady over here towards the front, uh, if we may. Um, Amanda Dickens. Uh, I'm currently a civil servant, but this is definitely not a government question. Um, I, I'm very interested that you're using, you're thinking about how can we use AI to potentially one day explore what consciousness is. Hmm. And I just wanted to try flipping the ethics of AI question. And are you thinking about what, what would be your view on whether an artificial general intelligence of a sufficiently powerful nature, we might need to think about, at some point, does it acquire rights? 
if it's kind of edging around that border of consciousness? Yeah, so, uh, you know, great question again. And, and this is, I mean, obviously we're straying into philosophy territory here, right? Which I actually do think AI quickly becomes in some ways when you start thinking about the far future. And, um, you know, my person, I mean, you know, we don't really know what consciousness is. Neuroscientists don't really agree, and even philosophers don't agree currently, right? So there's a definition problem, although I think, interestingly, we all feel we have it, right? So um, if I was to guess, I, if I was to guess, I would say intelligence and consciousness are what I would call double dissociable. So I don't think uh, co uh, intelligence requires consciousness and uh, vice versa. Right. I mean, I think a lot of animals, like if you have pet dog or cat, you know, I think a lot of us would say they, they're, they're conscious. They certainly seem to dream. Uh, at least my pet dog does. And, uh, you know, and, and, and it seems to be, you know, some aspects of consciousness, maybe not as high level as a human, but um, some aspects of that. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if you look at something like AlphaGo or Atari programs, there's, there's no question of any kind of consciousness there. I feel it's just it feels to me like just an algorithm, a, a, a sort of machine. And I think. It's going to be interesting to see, but there are lots of debates on that as whether, you know, it does intelligence require consciousness or vice versa. And I think, uh, you know, if it turns, I think the question, the answer to that question is going to be interesting either way, right? If we can create a system, I could easily imagine us building a fantastically intelligent system, AGI system, that doesn't feel conscious in any way like you do to me or I do to you. And then, the, then that would be quite interesting because then you could sort of take apart the AI system and sort of feel like, well, what's... Well, you know, what's, what's missing then in that case as compared to the human brain, right? What is the missing ingredient? Uh, and, isn't that, and it would also resolve some philosophical arguments about the nature of intelligence. So these are the kinds of things I think as a collateral of what we're doing. Uh, I think if we think about it in the right way with the right, with the right collaborations with neuroscientists and psychologists and, and, and perhaps sociologists, um, it might be an interesting tool, to, uh, like an experimental world to test things like the question of consciousness in it, you know, and, and things like qualia and sort of related issues, uh, which I think will we'll come up against as our systems become more intelligent. Okay, we've got time for a couple, couple more. Yeah. So let me go right at the back. Uh, the gentleman right at the back, uh, yes, uh, right there. And then one more I'll pick at random. And... Uh, uh, go, yeah, three more or something, yeah. <laughs> Thank you Sorry? very much. Go three more. We've we'll got three more, okay. Yeah. Thank you very oh, much, including going. for your informative chat. Um, a meta question here, which is around paradigms. Uh, natural consequences you were showing of the deployment of AI through its learning eventually results in the transcending of the paradigm of the system that it's operating in, right? AlphaGo, Atari. Yeah. What is the paradigm of DeepMind in relation to its deployment of AI? What system do you use to determine that paradigm? And to give an example of, of what does that mean practically, for example, is how do you, what system do you use to deploy your resources, your attention, your energy um, in a certain aspect of AI? Mm -hmm. For example, i.e. the AI itself, the who of the AI, as well as, for example, in relation to um, the what, so what is AI deployed on, for example, you were talking about some things, health, etc. Yeah, great. So I, if I understand the correct question correctly, I think you're talking about the actual organizational process of what we're doing. So like, how do we decide what to research and what to deploy, apply it to? I think that's what you're asking, is that right? That's right. Wait, okay, wait. So, um, so in terms of, uh, that's actually a great question and relates to the one point I made earlier in the talk about the, this new way of organizing science. So it, it's sort of a whole, I mean, it would be a whole, it's a whole lecture in itself, that like, what do we do differently? But you can think about what I've tried to do is bring in some, uh, you can think of them as agile software project management methods that I learned from actually writing computer games and, and big engineering projects I did in that early in my career. And I've tried to translate what does that mean in, in, in an analogous setting in for science? Can you actually project manage science even, right? Yeah. And also, can you um, assemble you know, a large team? We have a pretty large team for a research organization round a collective goal and actually build quickly on top of each other's work, uh, much more rapidly iterate that than you would get in academia, much more like you would get if you're building a product in 
um, uh, you know, a normal company, normal technology company. And how can you do all of that without damaging or, or, or hindering the bottom-up creativity that comes from, you know, in the best scientific organizations, right? The reason science works is big science, science with a capital S, works because you, you, you have tons of brilliant minds all kind of um, independently searching you know, for the truth, right? And, and for their own, or having their own ideas and then, and then pursuing those ideas. So how can you coordinate that in a light fashion without, just without, with, while still encouraging this sort of bottom-up flourishing creativity? And I think that's the, if there is a secret to why DeepMind has been successful is I think we've got that balance um, sort of just right, right? So that's, 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 that's sort of hopefully answers part one of the question. Second question you had was about, well, how do we decide what to deploy it to? Yeah. Well, uh, we actually have a huge sort of spreadsheet of factors. Perhaps we should actually have AI looking at that spreadsheet, but we don't do that, that yet. That was my next question. Yeah, by by to... humans. <laughs> and, um, and what we do in, in my applied division, which is led by um, Mustafa Suleiman, one of my co-founders, he, he yeah. runs our applications group, uh, is we have a whole bunch of desired uh, 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 properties for any application we are going to look at, right? And top of those things are social good, um, uh, 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 fit to the current level of our technology, you know, how much extra specialization is required. So the yeah. more specialization is required, the less we're likely we want to do that because ideally we want to use our core technology. Um, and then of course, they're, they're secondarily, there are things like commercial uh, opportunity and other things like that. But top of the things are, are sort of fit with research um, so that we're not pulling the researchers in directions they wouldn't go in otherwise. So it's, it's very important for us we're a research-led organization. You know, research is, the, is, is what we're primarily there for. And then secondly is the kind of societal good that we can, you know, we think we can uh, deliver uh, off the back of using these technologies. So that's why healthcare always comes up sort of top of, you know, on all those categories. And it was also the personal motivations of many of my team. So many of them are just passionate about uh, of course, about solving diseases and helping with medicine and so on. Um, but there are other things too, like um, uh, uh, renewable energies. So one of the big things we, we, one of the big achievements we did was we actually used the AlphaGo program, a variant of it, to, uh, to control the cooling systems in the data centers at Google. And the, the, the Google data centers are massive, right? Every time you do a Google search, you're pinging something to one of these data centers, and they use vast amounts of power. Uh, mostly it's renewable energy, but we would like to reduce that power. And what we did is when we, we, we used these processes on, on, on the cooling systems of controlling the fans and the pumps and the water pumps and so on, we saved 40% of the energy that those co cooling systems used, which is huge. So 15% overall, which is a, you know, a hu huge saving in the energy and obviously cost saving. And it's good for the environment as well as the cost saving. Okay, let's come to Thank the you. front, uh, perhaps gentlemen uh, over here. And then one quickie and then we're done, okay? Yeah. It's just over here on, on, in the front. Uh. Thank you. you uh, you're really quite an inspiration to all of us. So I studied neuroscience as you did, and I have a question about the elements of uh, deep neural networks. Yeah. You know as well as most in the room that neurons are electrically active, distributed branch trees. Yep. Synapses are probabilistic, have short-term uh, plasticity, which, which uh, is universal. It's in every neuron in both of our brains. Do you see any of these elements finding their way into deep nets? Yep. When? Are you on that? Is it for 10 years from now? Yes. No, so that's a, that's a really great question, actually. So, so as you pointed out, and everyone should know, is when, when we call these things neural networks, they're incredibly simplified versions of what real, our real brains are doing, right? As you just suggested. So our real neurons are much more complex things. And, um, you know, they are probabilistic. Uh, they use, they, they're called spiking neural networks. They, they, use, they use timing of spike trains um, for information passing. So they have a lot of properties that our simplified point, these are called point neurons, don't have. These are just really simple mathematical objects. In, and I would say they're inspired by neuroscience rather than actually in any way really mimicking real neuroscience systems. Um, but this is an open question for us. So I have quite a large neuroscience team, a, a, a proper neuroscience team at DeepMind, and we collaborate with many universities. It's around you know, 35, 40 people. So it's one of our biggest teams. And we, um, a continual question for us is, how neuroscience inspired are we going to be? So, that, so, so no, I said neuroscience inspired, uh, not reverse engineering neuroscience. So there are other groups around the world. There's also, there's a big EU billion euro project, the Blue Brain Project based in Switzerland, that's trying to actually explicitly reverse engineer the brain. 
So they're trying to co copy co cortical columns, real spiking neurons, and all the nuances of those, of, of how real neurons work and the messiness of that. Now, um, in my view, that's, that's, that's too low level, that's an implementation detail, because it, it, there's no reason, I don't think, to, to assume that an in silico system, so something that uses a silicon-based system, should copy all of the implementation details that a carbon system needs to do. Like, there's all sorts of reasons why our brain has to do things due to our biological constraints. Now, those constraints are different for a computer system. So I don't think there's any reason to have to you know, copy all of, including all the constraints and the specifics of the biology. Uh, what I'm more interested in is called systems neuroscience, which is what I study, which is the algorithmic and computational level. So what I'm really interested in is the functions the brain has and mimicking and or at least having, making sure I have the same capabilities in my artificial system, not the specific implementation details. But that line is a movable line. So, so it depends uh, partly on what neuroscientists discover. Right? If they discover there's some real uh, functional difference about using spiking neural networks, for example, we would then start investigating that uh, in a proper way. But and I have, you know, we have in our neuroscience team, we have experts in all of those different levels of detail in, in, of, of the brain, and they keep us all up to date with the latest literature on that. So it's an active, ongoing sort of uh, movable line um, that we have as to how much detail do we take in from inspiration from neuroscience. One last quickie before I make some concluding remarks, gentlemen, uh, over here. Hi, um, my name is Sumanis, um, and I'm an ML engineer. So it's a slightly technical question. Um, what are your thoughts on the ability of the deep uh, reinforcement learning framework to deal with unforeseen events? Mm. Because uh, one convenient feature of games is that it's an isolated environment. Yep. Um, the, while training, the network is seeing the game and only the game. There's no interruption, there's no break. Mm -hmm. um, something in the real world, like the weather or the price of a stock, uh, you know, we don't fully understand every single detail that could influence um, the outcome. Do you still feel that the framework will be applicable or do we need to evolve something better? Yeah, no, fantastic question. Look, it, so certainly the systems we have at the moment will not be enough, right? So that is the next sort of frontier really is how can you deal with um, uh, 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 unexpected information or probabilistic information or incomplete, incomplete information. So um, we do have researchers who are looking at things like poker, for example, that has obviously incomplete information. In, so you're in a situation or StarCraft, which is a computer, a very rich computer strategy game that doesn't, you don't have full information about the board like you do in Go. Um, but even they're still relatively simple compared to what you get in, in real life situations, as you pointed out. Uh, and then the other thing is, is the amount of data they use and the amount of experience they need. And I mentioned that with the one-shot learning. So that's a very key thing that we want to improve is how can you learn from fewer examples and ideally from just one example. So then you could even deal with a black swan event potentially, right, somehow. And in fact, all of that, that list of things that remain challenges, almost all of them you can think of as part of the solution to the problem you're talking about. So transfer learning, for example, would help. Because there, you're, you're, you know, you've learned how to deal with some, you know, uh, some structure in some world that you've you got used to. And then suddenly this new thing happens to you, or new domain. Um, but then you realize that underlying it, there's some similar structure, you know, maybe a hierarchical structure or something, even though it seems to look on the surface perceptually totally different. And then maybe you can use something from there to improve and speed up your learning in that new domain. And um, you know, those are all you know, amazingly complex problems that haven't, are yet to be solved. Perhaps you'll, you know, you'll solve some of these. Thanks. So let me just quickly make just a couple of uh, concluding remarks. So the Royal Society is a convener, uh, and we hope to uh, fuel this debate. But please remember the following about the Royal Society. We're independent of government. We're independent of industry, and we're independent of universities. So we can speak truth to power as appropriate in all those dimensions. And so you can be sure that uh, we'll make every effort, uh, not just to be trusted, but by using that independence to be trustworthy in this debate which is going to continue uh, for some while. And uh, to Demis, uh, I can just summarize on behalf of everybody with one word, brilliant. Thank <laughs> you.